in the Gospels that prayer is personal. It's a chat between individuals and God. And we should do it at all times, any time, and always and anywhere. Quite often to do it alone and in the quiet and get ourselves, take ourselves away from the humdrum of life. And Jesus does this throughout his life. And most especially, of course, the last night, the last supper, the garden of Gethsemane, and even on the cross as he was crucified. So, of course, we can take and learn a lot from all these references to prayer throughout the Bible, and even in the Old Testament, particularly in, in Psalms. But there's, there's one specific piece of advice that Jesus gives in response to a question from his disciples, as well as his prayer school on the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus teaches us how to pray. And I, I love the teachings and reflections of Pete Gregg, um, whom you hopefully remember, we did his prayer course during the COVID years. I was just thinking, the COVID years. Not during COVID, but the COVID years. And also, um, the great theologian N.T. Wright and what he has to say on this. So without more ado, this morning's Jesus Prayer School, the Lord's Prayer. Now, I'd go as far as to say that this is the Kingdom of God Prayer. And I'll explain that as we, we go through. And uh, Jonathan, if you'd like to put the, uh, the slide up. No? Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Okay. Um, there are two mentions of the Lord's Prayer in the Gospels, one in Matthew and one in Luke. And Matthew is Jesus basically talking to Joe Public followers on the Sermon of the Mount. And Luke is specifically another time with his disciples. And I'm sure Jesus would have prayed this prayer throughout his life in various other places. But there's just those two mentions. And the form of the prayer gives us a great model, a great structure and guide how to pray. Now, if you're like me, I think if I look back, it's always been too easy just to rattle through our Father in Heaven. Da, 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 da. But I'd like this morning to consider it in a different way and consider it like a, a symphony of music with different movements within that music. And in the Lord's Prayer, each movement gives us time to reflect on a specific focal point that the words are saying and allow us to expand with our own fuller prayers. So, here we go. Firstly, you'll note that the two prayers, same prayer, but a slightly different and yet similar wording. They both have these movements as we go through each sentence. And I'll come back to that in the end. And, and one key point, Jesus starts with when you pray, not if, but when you pray. So firstly, Father in heaven. Now this may be difficult for a few of us. However, think of a loving parent with the best intention to you. Matthew has the word our father. This isn't just some remote, this is our, my father. Incredibly personal, and yet it's the same for every human being, whatever, faith, sex, whatever, doesn't matter. It's a chat opener. It's almost like saying, Dad, I'm going to start talking with you. And God wants us to approach him and connect with him like a child. It's as simple as that. And he, he's as close to you and me as our breath. That's how close he is. Yet, this is the God creator, not just of this speck of a planet we call Earth, but of trillions of planets and universes out there. And yet we can have this relationship. Hallowed be your name. Here we move into praise and worship. Hallow means set as holy. So here's a good point to spend a bit of time in joyful 
grateful worship. It may be in silence or speaking a word or even in song. But here's the opportunity around those words. Hallowed be your name. Then we move on to your kingdom come, your will be done. Now, of course, we all like and want to be in control of our life and all that impacts it. However, this is the yield part of the P-R-A-Y. This is to allow what God wants and will see out. Because, of course, all things work to the purpose of God. Perhaps there's, perhaps there's something that you're wrestling with. Uh, name it to God at this point. Give it to God and allow his intervention. This allows the expansion of his kingdom of love and peace. And it's his kingdom that's been there, is here, and is coming stronger every day since creation day. We then move on to something a little bit pr practical. Give us today our daily bread. We generally think, I'm sure, that this is about personal needs, our daily needs, and even communal needs. Here it's about basic life. We don't sit down and say, give me a daily lottery win or give me a BMW. This is about basic needs. And, and this is a favorite area of mine in scripture is actually the translation from either Hebrew or Greek that the Bible was written in. We read it obviously in English. It needs a deeper understanding. Um, I believe it's not straightforward just to read word by word through the Bible as a story. There's deeper in there. Now, the Greek word translated daily bread here is apousias, which doesn't just mean earthly nourishment for the day, but it means also for the eternal day of the kingdom of God. It's nourishment for the eternal soul. And of course, it's pointing towards Jesus being the bread of life. So we've had two movements here, and they're around the kingdom of God. And Jesus is syncing this, synchronizing us with his role for this and into eternity. And we'll pick up on this in a moment through N.T. Wright. Now, I do love Jesus' affection for meals and drink, even wine, his hospitality and his communal living. From that first miracle at the wedding, turning the water into wine, he was there enjoying that right through to the Last Supper. And I can already see a big table in heaven. That's what's waiting us. And we can learn from that ourselves in terms of what Jesus was doing, connecting and being with the community. Not always with good people, as we put it, but he was there with those people. And of course, just as an aside, at communion, we eat the bread and drink the wine. But it's more about, as he says, remembering him. So... As I'm giving you these movements, why not com do communion at this particular point? Forgive us. Now, Jesus didn't need personally to say this. He did no wrong. He had no sins. He was pure. He didn't need to repent and seek forgiveness. Indeed, his sole purpose was to die on the cross to forgive our sins and Jesus freely gives that forgiveness as we repent and we say sorry. He wants us to be more and more like him, of course, and therefore to forgive others. So here's a point in the prayer to do so. And if you look at the two versions, Matthew talks about debt and Luke talks about sins. And if you, again, look deeper into the Bible... Uh, Colossians talks about what Jesus was doing, was closing down the debt that we have effectively caused. And th these would be words that would be very much understood by the Jews. They would understand the closing down of a debt. 
What's even more interesting, if you take the time to read the following verses in Matthew, verses 14 and 15, it talks specifically about forgiveness and the kingdom of heaven. So clearly, this is something that's really important to Jesus. Lead us not into temptation. Most of Jesus' public life was masked by trials, a running battle with the powers of evil. And John, of course, in, in chapter 1, verse 5, talks of Jesus as a light shines in the darkness. So Jesus is inviting us and his followers to share his own struggles, yet to gain and experience his same spirituality that kept him going. And here again, in this movement, we can expand our prayer and say, sorry for what we've done that's not so good, and move on to the deliver us from evil to seek protection in aspects that we're anxious in. Now, I said earlier on that there are some key differences between Matthew and Luke, but mostly it's the similarity. Of course, Matthew and Luke were coming from different... Matthew was very focused on the, on the Jewish, Jewish side. Luke was a doctor, very practical. And yet they have similar key highlights. Both start father. Now, the Jews didn't address as such. They taught Lord or God, or Yahweh. And in the Gospels, Jesus' favorite term is Abba, Father. There's a change occurred here. And Jesus, it's a closeness, it's an intimacy, there's no separation. And if you think back again to the, the crucifixion, the, uh, the curtain being ripped apart, giving us access directly to God, that the Jews did not see that because it was done through their rabbis. Now, is Jesus using this new name to correspond to a new beginning, a new covenant as we, we know it? God gave Israel a new name. He said to Moses, my name is Yahweh, Yahweh, at the Exodus, and that's how he would be known. And yet now we have Abba Father for the work of redemption of his son Jesus. So there is a kind of a second exodus happening here. And the new exodus, as N.T. Wright talks of it. Daily bread, come back to that. The provision of that synchronizes with that of the daily manna that they had each day in those many years in the exodus. Forgive us our sins. Now, of course, Jesus, when he's saying this prayer, is alive. He's yet to get to the crucifixion. And he's actually pointing towards the cross, which, of course, was the whole purpose of his life. And that's what he was focused towards. Through his death on the cross, our sins are forgiven. The Lord's Prayer, again, is not just about today but our end time blessing. Hence, why I started by saying, I've renamed this the kingdom of God prayer. N.T. Wright sums all of this up as an invite for us to share the innermost divine life and prayer life as we move in this new exodus. The whole prayer resonates with Jesus announcing God's kingdom, breaking in today and on us. It's personal, yet it's family. To share the intimacy of his life and his father's, his agenda, his work, his pattern of life, his spirituality. Now, I reckon that's pretty fantastic. And it brings to me this particular prayer to a new level beyond our normal, as I say, repetition of it. Praise our hallowed Father, repent, forgive us, ask, bread for today, yield your kingdom, your will. For yours, Lord, is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. 
Amen.